Let's see, Maurice more or less tricked me into this. <laughs> he came to me and said, hey, we're having this meetup. Do you have something to talk about? And I said, yeah, no, but we could make a Q&A. <laughs> yeah, um, so we wanted to release 050 in May or something like that, but then some things came up and some other things came up, but we finally released it uh, some weeks ago. And we even released 051 in the meantime, so we're making progress. Um, I don't know. Uh, are there already some questions? Otherwise, yes. oh, yeah. Well, maybe not. <laughs> I don't need a mic for that, but I was saying maybe you should, uh, for those who were not in DevCon, maybe you should uh, summarize what, uh, what, we, what is new in 5.0. Like, uh, yeah, um, so most of the changes were already part of the previous releases, and you could. I mean, 050 is mostly just um, enforcing you to be more strict, more explicit about things. And most of these things you could already activate in older versions with the Pragma. Um, and among these are explicit visibility for functions, uh, a special keyword for the constructor, a special keyword to emit events, um, forcing you to provide this, the, the data location of variables, so either storage, memory, or call data, because that was always a little bit confusing because it, the default was different depending on the context of the variable. Um, what else do we have? Uh, I mean, ABI encode and ABI decode, that's more like features, so you can now get access to the ABI coder from within your code, so it, it it, it, you can turn a uh, byte array into structured data and back. Scope. <laughs> scope? Oh, yeah, we have C99 scoping for variables now and not the weird uh, JavaScript scoping anymore. Um, yeah, but I think there was a question. Yes. <laughs> So I tested uh, 0 0.5.0, and I really like the features. The only thing I hate is the address table, because, um, yeah, I tried to port my project to 0 0.5, and there were some weird, weird addresses that came up. And why am I not allowed, as a developer, to cast an address to address table? But uh, yeah, it's, it's not allowed to the casting from address to address table. So address table was something we that was not part of the previous releases, and um, the reason we added it was uh, because. <laughs> so. Um, Contract types, uh, they have fallback functions and the fallback functions can be payable or they cannot be payable. And depending on that property, you can send either to the contract or not. So the send or the transfer function is only available on contracts that are uh, that have a payable fallback function. And the one change we did is we removed all the address members from the contract member, from, from the contract type because they were just, I mean, you might have a function that is called transfer on your contract, and that would conflict with the function that is part of the address type. And so if you want to use transfer, this is a little bit, needs a little bit of uh, working out. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, now this, this uh, fact of whether the, the fallback function is payable or not, that is lost. So, uh, yeah, so we remove the members from the contract type, so you had to convert the contract to address first to use the transfer function, but if you convert it to address, then the fact whether you have a payable uh, fallback function or not is lost, and because of that we introduced the address payable type. And so contracts with a payable fallback function can be converted to address payable, contracts without a payable fallback function can be converted to address. 
Okay, um, that's the reason why we introduced it. And um, we did some testing. So we, we run the compiler against uh, quite a lot of existing projects. And uh, we needed to make these changes to the existing products before we could run the compiler against it. And uh, while updating these contracts, we noticed that there's not too much you have to change. And the reason is that uh, usually you use the transfer function, or for example, if you use the if you use the withdraw pattern, then you call the transfer function or not not on an address that is stored in, your, in storage somewhere, but you call it an msg.sender. And msg.sender is uh, payable by default. <laughs> Um, and um, if you really want, so you can convert address to address payable when you go through an integer type. Yes, I did that. Yes. Okay, and <laughs> so uh, my question would be, so the, why the do you, reason, yeah, what are the, the situations reason, in which you need a uh, conversion? I inherit a contract from some other source, some uh, library or some, uh, let's say, open Zeppelin or anything, and um, there the address is specified as address, not as address payable, but I have one specific use case where I need to pay something to this address that was specified in the library. Um, that's basically uh, there was one thing where I wanted to self-destruct something to the owner, and I imported Ownable. And in Ownable, there is um, in, in Ownable, it's an address, and I had some part of the code where it says uh, self-destruct to owner, and that wasn't possible. And but that's a very and uh, why do you know whether the owner can accept Ether? Actually, I didn't, I didn't even care that because there shouldn't be any money on their uh, on the contract anyway. But uh, I needed to provide some address uh, to the self-destruct function. Yeah, but anyway, th this is a very fringe situation. But yeah, did you do you need to make? Lots of changes there, or no, no, was it no, just no, these two or three uh, explicit conversions? No, no, this was the only fringe um, scenario okay. where there were some problems with the table, with the address table function. Okay. Thanks. So in general, um, you probably know that. Okay. Most people who write compilers uh, write them in a self-hosted manner, which means that uh, the compiler is written in its own language, in, so in, in the language the compiler is to compile. This creates tons of problems and uh, just, yeah, but anyway, even without these problems, we can't do it because running the Solidity compiler inside the EVM would be kind of weird. And uh, this leads to a situation that uh, we as uh, compiler engineers don't really use the language a lot and because of that we always are happy about any feedback that we get from the people that actually use it. I think I talked too much, right? Uh, there was another question. <laughs> was there? Or not? Do you have a question? I think I saw a hand somewhere. <laughs> So what question, guys? <laughs> All right, uh, just a quick question. Uh, well, before you, uh, could you explain the, the point of view? The what? You. What about it? Uh, why, why uh, what's the point, really? Um, so that's something I, I noticed in your talk. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you were saying something like, and for perhaps I got it wrong, but it's something like, uh, we still need the EVM and Solidity due to some reasons, and uh, WebAssembly will not destroy it. Yeah. And the thing is, the, the reason for you is to be able to compile Solidity to WebAssembly. Right, okay. So uh, if, so, we're preparing for, I don't know, already over a year now to compile Solidity to WebAssembly and you is the uh, intermediate step to go there. And yeah, I mean, 
if you say you and you mean Solidity Inline Assembly, then this is another use for it, which allows you to write more low-level stuff that is not part, not, not available in the language. Um, yeah, and the other use of Yule is uh, as a an intermediate language inside the compiler. And the cool thing is, so with 050, we getting back to the other, on topic. <laughs> With 050, we uh, disallowed the so-called loose dialect of inline assembly or of Yule, and uh, the strict version. So the difference between loose and strict is that in, in loose, in the loose version, you have direct access to the stack. You can run, uh, you can use opcodes that manipulate the stack, and in the strict version, you only have variables and function calls essentially, and this fully abstracts away. The, the yeah whether or not there actually is a stack and uh, WebAssembly does have an expression stack but it's yeah different than so yeah it also has native function calls and because of that the stack is different from the one that is used in EVM and if we introduce Yule as an intermediate language then everything will compile to Yule and there we don't use any uh, features of the EVM, and it's not that you don't use the stack, and because of that, we can easily compile to both WebAssembly and uh, EVM. Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Do we have some more questions? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you have any estimation, estimations when 0 0.5 is going to replace 0 0.4 point whatever, or are they going to get along together, or 0 0.5 is going to take over 0 0.4 at some point, and when is it going to happen? So we have no plan to maintain uh, older releases. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your, your question. So, so 0 0.4 is over, so there is not going to be so the, there won't be any uh, patch releases for 04x. Okay, because so far it's quite the real release for branches. And we had no release for six months. Okay. And that was because we were preparing for the breaking change. So there was one intermediate bug fix release, but that was just to fix a very important bug. Okay. So more questions? So can you say something uh, how the inheritance structure is this uh, works? Because this changed quite dramatically um, in 0 0.5. Uh, I saw that you're now able to inherit automatically generated getter functions in 0 0.5. So it used to be that automatically generated getters don't um, comply to the interface they, um, they inherit. But what I also didn't see is um, that you can inherit interfaces from other interfaces. We didn't make too many changes to inheritance, actually. So the getter functions might have been one of the smaller changes. Um, and actually in 051 we added another change that uh, allowed more uh, function overwriting. Um, I think that the main reason that allowed getter functions to overwrite interfaces was that interfaces are now required. So interface functions now have to be external and cannot be public anymore. And we allowed public functions to override external functions. But that's only, I thought that was only part of 0.5.1. Okay. Do we have some more questions? Maybe one last question? Perhaps one word on inheritance in general. So we plan to do an overhaul of inheritance in 060. Uh, and this and the idea there is not to 
change the inheritance model itself too much, so we will still keep, uh, yeah, Python C3 linearization multiple inheritance model. Uh, uh, it's more like it will be more restrictive, so uh, especially when it comes to overwriting, so you can't just have two functions incoming from two different uh, um, base contracts, so two functions with the same name, and you will have to explicitly state whether you want a function to be overwritten or not, and things like that. Uh, yeah. um, I just want to ask a high level question, I'm not a developer, and most of what you just said I didn't understand. <laughs> um, so, what, what is the state, or what's going to happen with uh, WebAssembly? I mean, I, I heard in the podcast that there was some plans that in the end we will have different shards on Ethereum, and some will run on the EVM, and some will run Wasm, because um, I guess Converting Solidity contracts into Wasm is not really an option, so I just would like to know how, how that will all work out, like the coexistence. So on the Solidity side, the plan for next year is to be able to compile to eWasm, so that's not a problem. On the chain side, so I mean the compiler just will generate some bytecode and you can use it on, on every chain and on every sidechain, whatever you want. Um, yeah, I can't really say much about the adoption of WebAssembly in Ethereum mainnet or Ethereum 2.0. Okay. Yeah. I'm personally a bit worried about claims about performance because that hasn't been really vetted yet. Uh, but it will probably be faster due to it having native functions and it having, uh, yeah, 64 bit types. We have to see. All right. Do we have maybe a last question? <laughs> no? Uh, well, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking one more question? Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> but I'm out of smart questions. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it's not really a technical question. But you, you said like, uh, I mean, yes, there are from four to five, there's quite a lot of changes in the language. And I would be uh, interested if you had a, a couple of words of wisdom of how you handle, you know, like potentially compatibility breaking changes. What, uh, how did you handle that? How did you, uh, uh, yeah, how did you manage that? Um, I don't know. So I'm not sure if I really understand the question, but I can say something about uh, breaking changes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are different types of breaking changes. There is the one breaking change, which is, which just makes, so a, a contract that compiled before does not compile anymore. That's a easy breaking change, but there are, so there are some breaking changes also between four and five where the contract compiled before and it still compiles, but its behavior changes. And these are tricky and they should be kept to a very, very basic minimum and everyone using language has to know about them. Uh, I hope that's the case. <laughs> um, yeah, was that basically your question? Yeah, that's more or less like, did you document those changes, for example, those sort of second case changes? So there's a, um, we have a dedicated page in the documentation that says uh, these are the changes and this is what you have to do to your source code to uh, update it uh, to be compatible with 050. So I hope that documentation is enough for everyone. If not, then please talk to us. Um, we didn't get too much feedback on that yet, so I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad sign. <laughs> Okay. Oh, and perhaps also some meta information uh, that came out of the audit we what say had made whatever that was made. Uh, um, uh, they said we should make breaking changes more often, and we don't have a specific plan yet. But we're thinking about perhaps every two to four or six months. Um, yeah, let's see how that will work out. <laughs> <laughs>
So the definition of a breaking change is that contracts need to be rewritten. Uh, there are there is at least one contract that does not compile anymore, <laughs> or at least one contract uh, whose semantics change. Okay, so what happened during the release? Do these contracts go prime or? I don't know. So it's, it's just about the source code. So if they have been deployed, then it's not source code anymore. It's bytecode, and there a breaking change uh, is a hard fork. So that's out of the scope of the compiler. Otherwise, it's a break in the runtime. Yeah, exactly. Do we have another question? OK, I think the question answer session is over for now. Thank you so much, Christian.